Uh, tonight, unfortunately, we don't have a quorum for our meeting. However, we wanted to continue it. Um, we had a couple vacations and then a couple last minute cancellations, so we don't have a formal quorum, which, um, that being said, once again, we're still going to go ahead and move forward. Um, the agenda for tonight's meeting, we didn't quite finish the non-residential zoning district regulations from the last meeting. We're going to touch on those and then move forward with uh, general provisions. So uh, we have some very specific items. Um, as far as the structure for tonight, um, we'll see how it goes. Um, welcome to have questions as we move forward with any of these topics. Uh, we'd like to stay on topic um, with these items so we can move forward and progress. Um, if it does get a little bogged down with questions, we might ask you to hold your questions and so we can get through the information, hold those to the end. We'll kind of play that by ear, but you are welcome to um, ask questions as we're going through this. But once again, we would reserve the right to kind of maybe um, quell that a bit because we do have a lot of information to get through. So thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Elisa. Uh, she's the CT consultant who is uh, continuing uh, the presentation. Uh, good evening. As Kevin said, I'm Elisa Becky Rogers, the CT consultant. And thank you so much for having me here this evening. So can, you, can you speak up, please? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> So I um, will try to yell, but if my voice starts progressing downward, someone just do this. <laughs> start yelling again. So uh, this evening, we just run over the agenda quickly. We will briefly review the zoning ordinance update process. As Kevin said, last time we were voted for the regional districts, and we will continue that discussion tonight with the Alexander Pike Mixed Use District and the Neighborhood Commercial Office District. And we will begin the review of the administration chapters which includes things like the development review process, and then we will close with the next steps. In terms of the zoning ordinance update process, we completed phase one back in February, and that is actually on the city's website if you'd like to look at it. And that phase one document really did incorporate the recommendations for the, in a, in a bullet form to the zoning ordinance and the subdivision ordinance. Um, we're in phase two now, and major code changes are being fleshed out and this phase will last until roughly August. In phase three, we will complete all the amendments, align the zoning map with the new zoning district, and then in phase four, we will then move to the adoption of the code. Um, so we won't be meeting in June, and I know that's sad because we all get used to seeing each other every month, uh, but we won't be having this conversation in June. We will resume in July, and at that point, we'll be talking about the four base districts, which are for downtown, Midway, and and this schedule is also on the city's website. So as we said, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the conventional districts. And I just want to remind you that in the conventional districts, this is really where the foundation of the district is land use instead of building form. So this is the map of the Alexander Pike mixed use district. It includes parcels that front on Alexander Pike that today are zoned commercial, office, and industrial and it runs from 471 to Hollywood's Drive, uh, basically. So where we stopped last month was talking about the development standards. Um, um, the, can I stop you a minute? Um, the mixed use district, doesn't it just stop at the YMCA? And we talked about the mixed use residential district was from the YMCA to Hollywood's, if I'm not mistaken. Is, is that a separate one, or is this kind of combination of so we have two. We have the Alexander Pike Residential District, right. which is much smaller. It is all it's the properties today that are zoned single family that front on Alexander Pike. These are all the non-residential parcels. So, and, and I'll show you those. As okay. I, I didn't know if those were two separate. There are two separate zoning districts. Okay. So you had said to Hollywoods. I think this this mixed use district is just to the YMCA. Right? No, it goes all the way down to Hollywoods. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the Hollywoods, oh. and it's all the okay. That's still confusing. Yeah. So there's, is, there a, is there a separate piece of that that's the residential? Yes, there's a separate zoning district. Okay. So there is a separate, there's Alexander Pike mixed use, and then there's the the residential district. district. Correct. And the residential district is from YMCA to Hollywood? Essentially, it's the piece between the two oranges here. I'm just going to go up and point. Which it is. It, it's essentially from, <laughs> yeah. So you can see it's oh, basically from the Winkler Fields. Yeah. 
Okay, that's the residential. That's the residential district which we talked about last month. Okay, Woodfield to Hollywood. Uh, essentially. I mean, not, I mean, not really, I mean, because this is Hollywood's right. down here. Woodfield is, is pleasant. Yeah. So Cromwell has it all the way up to essentially Woodfield Elementary. What's the part in the middle? What's in between where you're calling that? Right here? Yeah, because that's not highlighted. Correct, because that's the, the Alexander Pike uh, residential district that we discussed last month. Okay, so you're just calling that residential and then these are the mixed use. Correct. Okay, so this is a separate zoning district okay. from the residential district. And it is what you see colored in orange. Okay. So right. just to give, to, to give you a little bit of frame reference, this is a banker parcel, this is a liquor store, this is Marsh building, this is the office building. And you'll see pictures of these in just a minute. All the way down to the small salon here and the engineering building here. Is, is the residential changing or is it staying R1 C? Okay, so what we talked about last month is that the parcels that front on Alexandria Pike that are today zoned residential, and I don't remember if they're R1C or R1B, but whatever they are. Uh, oh, there's not. Um, there's C. C, okay. Will then move into what's called the Alexandria Pike Residential District. And then that district will permit, by right, meaning without anything other than a building permit, single family homes. And then also, in other circumstances, townhouses and some small multifamily. So that was a discussion that we had last month. And that is also, that district is up on the website if you want to view it again what the proposal is for the, for the residential area. So that's your recommendation, that's what you're saying. Right, because again, all of this is based on the community plan that was adopted by the, the city in 2018. And so it really did talk about doing some different things along Alexander and Pike for those single family homes that front on the pike, not the ones that are in the neighborhoods on the other side. Folks, can I offer a drink? We're going to do this in sections, we're not going to do it like one huge lump because it would be too much for everybody to remember their questions. But well, we were talking about maybe Elise is going to do it in sections, and at the end of each section, she'll allow everybody to ask questions. But if we just let her get through, and I appreciate it. I don't think we finished. I do appreciate what you're saying. I think last time, we kind of cut off at the end of that section. Let her get through this section, it. and then and then everybody can we ask We finished the residential chapter, the residential district. We, did, we cut off the mixed-use district, which is where we're starting right now. So let's do this, because we have a lot of ground to cover tonight. If we have time at the end, and I actually still have the slides for residential district in this deck, we'll go back to it. If we don't have time tonight, then we will start with it in July. But keep in mind that none of this is written in stone, and it is all completely draft right now. So by putting it off a couple months, we are not in any way going to ignore it or not talk about it or cast it in stone as it's currently drafted. Well, we just appreciate the clarity there because I had no idea what you were naming that middle part. So thank you for Not a problem. So let's just put that in the parking lot. We can cover it tonight, or we'll okay. start with it in July. How does that sound? It sounds good, Lisa. Can I ask one question, though, because it's just something that you refer to the community plan. Where exactly in the community plan does it say anything about converting a single family district to multifamily? Because my understanding here is that is Alexander Pike Residential currently a single-family zoning? The proposal is to convert that to multi-family housing. Where exactly in the city plan, anywhere, does it say that we're going to do that? Because I can't find that I read the whole 240 feet. So it talks about that, that the houses that are along the pike, that front on the pike, may not be viable over time and give some suggestions to do that. So when we come back either at the end of this or in July, we will go back over that again. But let's just keep talking about the, the mixed use district. But I'm gonna write a note that we come back to that. <clears throat> either tonight or July. All right. So where we stopped last month was looking at the setbacks within the, the mixed use district and particularly the front setback. You remember we talked about the fact that we're proposing a minimum and a maximum front setback. And the minimum being 20 feet and the maximum being 30 feet. 
So the building has to be either you know, between those two marks. Um, intertwined with that is where parking goes on the lot. And what, so that's what we were talking about when we left off um, last month. What I do want you to all be aware of is that while this is a chart that has numbers in it, you will notice that there's a footnote that says the Planning Commission can grant waivers to these numbers under certain existing conditions. And the reason we put that in is because we know we have an enormous amount of built properties already. And so while we may think that this is where we want buildings to go, where parking should go, it may not always work. So in the back of your mind, keep the fact that these are numbers and these may be something that they may or the Planning Commission and the Council may ultimately agree on or not agree on, but that is really not setting in stone such that someone can't develop their land. Um, to, so to help with this discussion, I prepared some slides illustrating the existing front setbacks along the corridor, just to refresh our minds what the built environment looks like right now. And so I determined these setbacks based on the Planning and Development Services GIS layer, which is geographic information. Um, I verified it with the Sanitation District 1's uh, GIS. But please know that these setbacks are not exact. They're what I can pull off the web, but they're, they're sort of close enough for government work for this discussion. And I also keep in mind that setbacks are usually measured from the front of the building to the front lot line. So, starting at Harleywood's Drive, uh, please note that the parking lots on these slides are shown in white. So not only can you see what the setbacks are, you can see where the parking lot is. So starting at Harleywood's, the salon that you see in the bottom corner here, um, at 1600 Alexander Pike has a setback of 32 feet. The engineering building next door has a setback of 65. And Seisha next door to that at 1504. And please keep in mind that this is an old photograph. It was taken last fall. I know they've done some um, nice landscaping since then. Um, Safe Ship has an 11 foot setback. So I'm just going to run through these to sort of refresh everybody's mind about what the existing setbacks are. As you move further up the pike, uh, starting with the small one story office building at 1501, it has a setback of 44 feet. The two-story office building next door has one of 21 and a half, and then the more modern-looking office building at 1403 is set back 24 feet. So again, notice for 1419 and 1403, the smaller setback with the lack of parking out front. There's a little bit of parking on the side here at 1419. Uh, 1463 Alexander Pike, which sits at the corner of the Pike and South Fort Thomas. Avenue has a setback of 25 feet at its closest point. Not exact, but at its closest point, that's where it is. The building next door at 880 is looking at 58 feet. At the corner of Alexander Pike and Grand View, along the corridor, at the setback is 22 feet. And I say that because it's on the corner. Um, I don't have a setback for that new office building that's on the street across the street. I mean, the two story building um, beyond that. Exactly what that is. There's a big president sitting here at the apartment. 
not. I think the idea is that it'd be nicer to look at buildings and have the parking in the back. Correct. I think that's definitely what we're saying. And the only issue with that is almost all of those, almost all of those buildings have parking in the front. To a certain extent, they do. Well, but not all of them. Yeah, a good percentage of them do. So keep in mind that while, as I said, these are numbers in a chart, but you do have, as a planning commission, as this is currently drafted, do have the ability to grant waivers so that you're not forced to confront the bill of adjustment. And so you're setting the precedent that you would like to see buildings as opposed to parking. The discussion last week or last month was precisely what you said, Jerry, was that in many cases, and a lot of it's just simply because of the way the lots are configured, you end up with a parking between the building and the front lot line. So, you know, it's a policy choice. Do you want to set the policy that we prefer to see a building than parking? And if that's the case, then you have the authority to do something different if necessary. I think that's what we prefer. Yes. But in some areas, all the parking's in the front, and it would look silly to have that building in the front when all the neighbors have their parking in the front or have parking in the back. So I think that makes sense for us to be able to grant a waiver in certain cases to respect the existing setbacks with the buildings, the new buildings built in for those empty spaces. And all along 27, there's a lot of topographical issues you have to deal with, too. Right. So we're not going to really get a homogenous look going along 27. And you're also not going to get the homogenous look because of the map that we started this discussion with, right? You basically have these commercial developments at nodes. So they're not. So the best you can hope for would be for each node to be consistent. But given topography of the existing built environment, that's not going to happen in the near future. Based on the discussion we started to have last meeting, I think that's kind of, I think that all makes sense. So we'll keep it the way it is. 20 to 30 for setback, but the ability to change that in a specific development plan just doesn't work well that way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you do talk about in the phase one having design standards for new construction and renovation along this mixed use district. The design review board would be given the authority to grant exceptions for minor work. They would also be given the authority to grant modifications in situations for existing buildings and site conditions. The standards basically require buildings to be oriented toward the street. They mandate entrances along Alexander Pike that prohibit blank unadorned walls. They require glazing on the front of buildings and other similar standards. Example photos will be included in phase three once everyone is okay with these standards. Any discussion about the design standards as they were drafted? Are you saying that anything here goes before the design review board? Correct. And that's what we talked about in the phase one, expanding their responsibilities outside of downtown and midway to do work along Alexander Pike and as well as the next district that we discussed. And right now it's only in the CBD and the midway district that we have those? It's downtown. It's downtown and midway right now. So they would be greatly expanding their authority. So any concerns about expanding their authority along Alexander Pike? Explain that to me one more time if you don't mind. I'm sorry. That's okay. So right now the design review board is only authorized to review buildings and signage and that sort of thing in downtown and in midway. Okay. And so the proposal here would be to expand their authority to review buildings both in the Alexander Pike mixed use district as well as the neighborhood commercial office district that we'll discuss next. The 27 border basically. Correct. And then the other parcels that we'll discuss in just a second. And that includes the area that's currently zoned single family homes? No. There may be some in that situation, but what we're talking about right now would be them having express authority, them being the design review board, having express authority to look at building renovations and new constructions along US 27. But not the part that's right now zoned single family homes? There are some standards if, and again we will talk about the residential district either tonight or. Okay, so this is something different than the residential district. But yes, there's something slightly different there, but we can talk about that. Essentially give some 
direction over top of anything that has business oriented, right? Like right. they do now. So, yeah. so that is exactly it in a nutshell. It would be expanding their authority to anything that's non residential yeah. um, right. in the city. But nothing at the north end, like, if, you know, we're usually at 915 and all, then they don't need to go to the design review board. They, 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 they do. They do. Oh, okay. Yeah. It sounded like you were saying. No. All no. commercial. Pretty much all commercial. Okay, thanks. So quick question on this, on the design standards, and again, I won't keep you long. If they are close to a residential, are there going to be requirements for them to put up noise and tree barriers no. behind them, buffer zones? So that's not actually outside of design review, but yes, the zoning code itself will have buffer standards and screening standards and those kinds of things to screen between, for example, the parcels that are along. Uh, US 27 that back up to single family detached. We have not discussed what those standards should be if it's going to, for example, go to an apartment building or whatever else. But I think I could say without having had the discussion that the Planning Commission would agree to having buffer and screen between commercial and single family detached. And if I've overstepped, y'all can tell me. We currently have that, and that's definitely something that we look at and review now. Um, there's a lot of screening requirements. Well, I know we don't have that on an existing property that's close to us, and we're get, they've moved their, I mean, again, not to get picky here, but they've moved their dark garbage dumpster, which now we view, we see, and now we have a ton of crows flying all over our yard 24-7 with this garbage dumpster. So, and this is a multi-use family situation unit on 27 that backs up to uh, single-family homes on Fort Thomas or in, uh, on Hawthorne. So yeah, so existing there. uses are a little different. We can certainly talk about that individual situation. I can look into it and see if it meets the regulations, but um, you know, generally it's new construction, new modifications. You know, there's a lot of grandfathering that goes on with existing structures, but we can certainly take a look at that particular issue and see if it's compliant with what we have. Yeah, we're just trying to make sure that if you do new stuff, that we kind of prevent that kind of stuff from happening out of the day. If there was a development plan on file for that development and it shows the dumpster in a certain location, it shouldn't move without the city approval. So if they've done that, I think that's something you would pick up with staff, okay. not at the plan. Okay. Well, I was just, again. There might not be, I mean, it might be an old enough development that it was just one of those things that's been around for a while and there was no development plan that the city approved that would show the dumpster in a certain location. Okay. And then the final, final major component of the Alexander Pike mixed use district is we talked about during the phase one um, exempting 5,000 square feet of parking requirements if developers provide a green and low impact, low impact development and or improvements um, into the right of way. And actually, um, the commissioner who mentioned the improvements in the right of way isn't here. Um, but given the fact that hopefully US 27 will be much more multimodal in the future, um, some of those improvements would be things like bus shelters and those sort of things. So I just want to read you what you would have, what a developer would have to provide in order to be exempted from the parking. So in terms of low impact development, uh, they would have to include at least two of these things like rainwater harvesting, fire retention cells, there's a picture of that in the draft, uh, permeable pavement, bioswells, green roofs, and other low impact um, development techniques that would be approved by the city engineer. Or they could have a green building that's either certified silver or better. Um, or the public improvements within, um, along US 27, they'd have to provide at least three of these. A bus shelter, seating at bus stops, bicycle parking, bicycle repair stations, increase the sidewalk width to eight feet, provide respite areas for pedestrians, art installations at bus shelters, or anything else that the Planning Commission believes benefits pedestrians and transit riders. Um, so again, this would be incentivizing either low impact development or these types of multimodal facilities within the right of way if um, you agree that forgetting 5,000 square feet of parking is appropriate in order to incentivize those. Did you say forgetting? 5,000 square feet of parking, meaning that they don't have to provide parking? Correct. So what do you take away? 5,000 square feet. So if their building is 20,000 square feet, they would only have to provide parking for 15,000 square feet if they do some of these public enhancements. So it just reduces parking requirements. So it just reduces parking requirements. Now what that means is 
If they want to put in additional parking, that's certainly their, they're certainly allowed to do that. What you would have to understand is that many, many municipalities today are greatly reducing their parking requirements. Many of them are doing away with them because the reality is no one's going to build a business without parking. So why should a municipality dictate, this is the, the philosophy behind it, why should a municipality dictate the specific, specific number of parking spaces for a developer or for a particular use? So the idea here is, and it came from the, the community plan, that we really did want to see some green impact or low impact development within the city, is that a way to incentivize that and get people to think about doing it was to give them something such as forgiving 5,000 square feet of their parking requirement. And the planning commission, um, as we talked about this during the phase one, was generally in favor for it. They just wanted to see a little bit more um, fleshed out what I meant by that. And then, as I said, one of the planning commissioners said it was a really good, I thought it was a really good idea uh, to add those improvements within the library. It, it, my only thing is, and I don't really want to street by it, but the only place you're going to go if you don't have enough parking is down to the side street. But, but keep in mind, and that's that, huge. It is huge. But after doing this for 30 years, um, and I have heard that concern in many, many different types of places over time. Um, it is the very rare developer or use that doesn't provide enough parking for their site. Because in doing so, they then hamstring themselves. So while that tends to happen in downtowns that don't have, you know, on street, that don't have individual parking lots, in places like US 27, they're going to provide parking and they're going to provide the parking that they need. And, and, and in most zoning codes that have a strict parking requirement. The parking is typically much more than it's needed for that use. So all we're trying to do is is reduce stormwater runoff, you know, provide more green space, you know, uh, take away some of those spaces that may never be used. If if the developer wants that. Correct. Well, I think the only reason for Thomas is our concern about that is if there's a football game on Friday night, all the side streets are full. Now, that's not going to happen with a commercial development that has a parking lot, but, you know, a school event, whenever there's a school event, you know, so, you know, everyone out there is thinking, this is going to be a mess, but it's not going to be, because if, if you're developing a commercial area, you're going to provide new parking there that, that's going to, going to be sufficient for the office, where there are a lot of places down where it just doesn't happen. Right. But the side streets in those areas already don't have enough parking. Yeah, and it, it's, it's not it's not a complete elimination of requirements of parking. It's a reduction of parking by five thousand square feet. I mean, which I don't know what that equates to in spaces, but five thousand square feet is a little less than an eighth of an acre. I mean, this is three thousand square feet probably right here. Right. <laughs> so you know, smiling more than the size of this. This is, a lot, this is a lot of parking. This is a lot of parking. Well, once again, the, some of these assets, as far as the community is concerned, are creating more green areas. I mean, we're, we're trying to lessen the impact on a site. So th these, are, these are things that, if you look up a lot of these sites too, I mean, they're down along um, where there's not a lot of residential streets. Um, you know, all the way from 471, all the way up to the Y, there's not a lot of residential streets coming off of there. So, right. if, um, you, if you, oh, sorry. No, that's it. I was going to say, if you look at like the site of like Fort Thomas Plaza, if that were ever to be redeveloped, I don't know how many acres Fort Thomas Plaza is. But, and I don't, you know, I live in Fort Thomas, but I don't go to Fort Thomas Plaza a whole lot. But the few times I'm up there, that parking lot is nowhere near full. Are we talking so, about the one on Highland Avenue? No. 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 Oh, the one that's by the Rand dealership. dealership. Right. The Rand dealership. Right. Down by the parking lot. Right. Where? Joe's like a bad one. That's Highland Plaza, and my wife has a business there. Yeah. Oh, Highland Plaza. Right. I thought I was going to say, that part is kind of right. really rough. But I'm talking, I was mentioning Fort Thomas. Yeah, Fort Thomas. Okay. I don't think we're totally taking the wrong pole, though, either. You know what I'm saying? But, but again, totally so. let's just keep in mind that this is an incentive. No one has to do this. We are not saying that every single solitary commercial building in Fort Thomas is not going to provide the parking for that 5,000 square feet. We're saying if someone decides to provide these incredible amenities, 
then they, that 5,000 square feet is forgiven. Keeping in mind, as I said, that it's the very rare user developer that will build something and not provide sufficient parking for their users. Because all they do is end up making their development less useful to themselves and having to deal with the city when all the neighbors are complaining about the parking down the side streets. But again, this is an incentive. It is not in any way completely getting rid of parking requirements. And this planning commission has not said a word about getting aware of the parking requirement. While that has been a discussion in other communities, it is not a discussion here. So would somebody be able to put a, um, a storage facility like they had previously planned in these locations? No. Okay. All right, any further discussion about this? Let's move on. So the final non-residential area, it will be the zone neighborhood commercial office district. It includes Fort Thomas Plaza, where we were just talking. Uh, the Highland and Grand areas, and the intersection of South Fort Thomas and Bivouac. That one building? Yes. That, that today is zone professional office. And what are you proposing? Neighborhood commercial office district. So essentially what it already is. I mean, we simply can't make it something other than office or professional office or maybe commercial. We can't simply say you can't have some viable office use on it. That is not something that we are constitutionally allowed to do. Okay. My, one, one, one of my confusions, I don't want to, it isn't about me, is the maps and zoning maps that I have spent hours in zoning office in support working with, they're so clearly outlined, and I don't see that in any of the new proposals. I, I don't see any place that you could like lay that over it and say this will now become this. It seems it, it seems as if we, you know, shook all the dice and rolled them out and said we won't be piecing them back together. It won't be a puzzle that fits again. The next phase, I promise you there will be a new map. Um, I can also promise you, with the exception of US 27 and those single family zoned areas, everything that is zoned single family today will continue to be single family. So if it says R1C right now or R1B, it's going to be R1C or R1B at the end of this. And what would the exception be said? We, we will be talking about the Alexandria Pike residential district either tonight or in July. That is the only place where I'm saying that the, a single family residential district will change. Okay, and, and I'm truly promising to do my best to shout it here. So basically, Alexandria High, I consider it two different universes. The one is if you go from what we used to call Christian up to Woodville, and the other one is if you turn by Woodville and go down Alexandria High to Newport. Depths and yeah, marsh and that. The top is red. To me, the top is. I knew people that lived up there and never knew anybody lived down there because it was. So you're saying the residential part from Woodville to Hollywood can change. That will change. Again, let's please have our conversation about US 27 and residential either tonight or in July. And what's being proposed for that? I'm sorry. Go ahead. You know, I think when you said that there's different that that section is residential, that doesn't mean it's going to stay residential. What is being proposed for that area? It's multifamily. No. Oh, I read that in there. Okay. What is being proposed is a combination of single family, townhouses, and small multifamily. So if a person next door to me sells their house, you can put, oh, 200 year multifamily unit? No. I can guarantee you they will not put that there. What can they put in there? I don't know where you live, but again, I would really respectfully ask that we continue the conversation about the residential district along US 27 either later tonight or in July. You know, Alicia, you don't have a quorum here for your planning commission tonight, and I think a lot of people are here just for this reason. And last month, if you have to excuse me, but I, I, I understood it is single family residential. And that was, was being proposed was for multifamily townhouse. Correct. But not a 200 unit townhouse. Not 200 units worth of multifamily. So that, respectfully, 
you want to just get this out of the way so that you can go on with your night and you can discuss that part? Or do you want everybody to wait here till the end? Because a lot of people are here to discuss that part. Okay, well, I'm going to leave to Kevin and one of the requirements in that multi-use, multi-residential was a limitation on the width of the building, or the length of the building. So, um, I forget what it was. I mean, I could pull all this back up, but, but it's, I'm going to leave it to you. You can only get so many units. And and, and so the well, that's, that's primarily it. I mean, there, there's this assumption that all of a sudden there's going to be apartment buildings through here. There has to be, I mean, somebody would have to come in and, and buy several lots. To, to do to do that and then and then still they couldn't put up what like Lisa said 200 units you know there there is very precise and um, design standards to that um, so it, it's not as not as simple as just you know buying those and then putting up a big apartment building that's four stories high it, it, that's not the character or what we're looking to do that's not what is proposed there are still density requirements so many units per acre. And it, it would be tough to put together enough lots to really get more in the acre or two there. If I recall that, maybe it's width and height, but not height, you want to assist us on the city. That's pretty high, isn't So, again, I'm going to ask Kevin and the Planning Commission do we go back to US 27 residential or do we move forward? Have you? Planning Commission, it's your, your I, I'd like to get through what we're going to get through, or we're just going to be pushing everything back a month. Uh, we're we're going to be pushing everything back. Do you have questions beyond just the fact that you can't put a big building there, and you probably couldn't put more than six or eight or maybe ten units in the building, uh, based on, the, the, it's not a deep zone. Uh, the zone they're talking about is not really that deep. Uh, if you have a map here, you can see that. We did not clear that much. Oh. Last week, but uh, last month. Let's do. All right. Uh, we might as well talk we about. We really don't get any deep zones, do we, in Fort Thomas? Because it's so compact. Where we are. Well, especially on this one, they're just. You know, it's it's the width of one lot. The lot's facing. Yeah. Uh, the only one. Yeah. Face. Yeah. There's some things that are not to the deep. I mean, I live across from Tom's Ranch, and our house is a deep backyard, and there's. No, we're not talking about the deep backyard. We're talking about the depth of the lot. There's a difference. All right. That's from the Shack of the Lee. You have a deep backyard. It's a White House next to the ranch. All right. I just read something. Okay. Here we go. So, this is the Alexander Pike Corridor Residential District. So, it goes essentially from Woodfield Elementary here. This is what felt like right here. Okay. Down to Hollywoods, essentially. To Hawthorne. Yeah. Hawthorne, what I say. So, this is the district. And it's only what you see in blue. Oh, so Actually, excuse me, it goes down to Pleasant. Sorry. Pleasant. So, this is Pleasant down here. This is Pleasant here. So everything that is not in blue stays smart and zoned exactly like it is today. There's nothing changing about it. But the blue will change. change. I'm sorry? The blue will change. No. This it's is the Sons Arena right there, that okay. depth. And if you look at the depth of these lots, there's no way you can get a Sons Arena in that, mm -hmm. in that location. This is uh, the part that the community plan talked about, townhouses, talk about a mix of, of that's beyond just a single family in some areas. In fact, this friends on a major street seem to be the best place to do a mix of, of single family, two family, you know, some, some you know, four to six to eight units. But if, if you look at the size of those lots, you'd have to buy up a whole block and you still wouldn't be even half the size of the lot that sounds great to sit so. And so if you're concerned, the planning commission to maintain setbacks, you know, from, from these properties, and the lots aren't even up to have like Jerry said, a son Serena. It's, if they're small, they would be small, eight unit bill, eight, eight unit maybe, and that's that's the best case scenario if somebody purchased several lots. 
And the way we talked about limiting the building size, you didn't even build the South Street building there. I mean, I don't know if you build one half that size. So, so nowhere in the community plan do I see anything that remotely talks about changing a single family district to multifamily housing. Okay, so and let's just back. It may not sound small at all, but if I'm going to, there's single, I've driven this several times since we talked about this last month. These are houses along here. Yes, they are. They are single families. So, 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 so what, what you're doing is changing the essential character of this neighborhood. Nowhere in our community plan do I see anything talking about, as a matter of fact, I see just the opposite. I see that we're, we're trying to retain the essential character for Thomas, not to change the essential character for Thomas. I see one little piece in there that talks about providing more housing for grandma and for young professionals. So I'm not understanding how putting an eight family here in any way addresses stuff for grandma or young professionals because there's no way we're going to guarantee that it's going to be grandma or young professionals. So I'm not understanding how changing single family housing to multifamily housing in any way accomplishes one piece of our community. So the community plan does talk about, as I said, that, that the long-term viability of these single-family detached dwellings along US 27 is questionable. It also talks about the need for diverse housing options within the community, and it does specifically talk about those folks who are retired or young professionals, meaning people who can't necessarily afford to buy a single-family detached dwelling, but might want to live in the community with where their parents are, because their parents are providing childcare or whatever else and they want to live in a townhouse or a row house. So the plan does talk about providing. Could you please could you please refer me to it? Because honestly, I can't find it. I've got stuff here to ensure that Fort Thomas continues to be an attractive, desirable, and family-friendly city with a park-like setting. I have um, to so be again, a sustainable, friendly bedroom community that's known for its natural resources. I mean, honestly, I'm not trying to cause trouble here. I'm just saying, let's look at the character of Fort Thomas and let's think about. I talked to somebody who sat on, um, the, uh, two people actually, who sat on the committee for this. I'm like, what, what happened? And they said, yeah, a couple people brought up that they'd like to have the kids live in Fort Thomas and they can't. And a couple people brought up it'd be nice for their moms to, you know, be in an apartment. We have lots of apartments here in Fort Thomas, lots. The, 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 focus, the focus area for the Alexandria Pike specifically says to undertake a master plan study for the overall corridor. I mean, sure, you're doing a master plan I, study, but, but that's different than, than, than proposing an essential change to a neighborhood. This is a neighborhood. This is not this is not Alexandria Pike. There's lots of streets off of this. The streets off of that, I would agree, are neighborhoods, right. but I would not say uh, a road with a 35 mile an hour speed limit and, and what used to be four lanes, but it's now three lanes, where you have, you know, quite quite a long distance across the street. I would call that a neighborhood. When you talk about a neighborhood, yeah. I, think I, I disagree. Those one kids of the yeah. cul-de-sacs we have here with, you know, 15 mile an hour speed limits. Huh? What's your attitude? Uh, respectfully, uh, S. Beck, and she grew up there. Four lanes. <laughs> I mean, I've lived there practically my whole life. I, you know, um, and I read on page 66 of the proposal, it said, because of the plan, it will be difficult to maintain the residential environment in the long term. But so I think what is frightening all of us, this isn't going to, in the long term, or maybe the short term, it's not going to be yeah. residential. And the reason, Jerry, we went to the three lanes on 27 was because that, was, that is within four blocks, five blocks of the school. And the parents walk their kids to school. So it, they're really not looking for it to become, you know, commercial high or high density. Yeah. So it's, I mean, I, again, this is all draft. Yeah, right? okay. We're the council. We're just sharing. Decide, that's all. Um, what the whole thing we're in. But I do want to clear up in terms of what the uses are being permitted in this district. So as you can see here, single family and two family would be permitted by right. You come in, you get a building permit from Kevin. Life is good. The multifamily and the townhouses would be restricted, which means there is a set, certain set of standards that they have to meet in order to be permitted. They simply can't just come in and get a building permit and do what they want to do. Those design standards would be things such as the building's orientation, the number of townhouses that are attached, the, the number that got thrown out is you could have no more than four attached. 
that you um, have, we would um, limit the density <coughs> in terms of 4,000 square feet per dwelling unit. So again, we are looking at very small multifamily developments, similar to what you see in the picture here. What is that third picture down of? This one? Yeah, what's that photo from? That's from Newport. Oh, okay, well, why you better? Fort Thomas would be better. Um, so this is, and I can provide you some from Fort Thomas as well, that are you know, fairly large multifamily. Um, in fact, there's actually one on Grand. There's, uh, there's a number on Grand. Some of them are just right up here. Um, there's one right on, I mean, the one I was talking about. It doesn't look like a house. But. And that's the point of that. So what, the reason I put this here is because these are the types of multifamily that we're thinking would be appropriate along US 27. Um, and many communities are called mansion apartments or large house apartments, it's, it's as, opposed to, as opposed to the very large apartment buildings that you're thinking about, like the San or whatever it's called. I don't think people are thinking of Sun Serena. I think people, honestly, I don't mean to go back to this, but whether you think it's a neighborhood or not, you're, I don't know where you're living for, Thomas. Becky's my cousin. I grew up going to her house. We went down Hawthorne. One of Becky's best friends was on Hawthorne. Those kids play in those side streets. So not only are you talking about taking out Alexandria Pike, you're talking about taking out the backyards of maybe the first three houses on all those side streets. No. 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 So their woods is now the back of your multifamily house. And I have one of those properties where 100 feet of it will now be behind whatever it is you plan on raising and putting on the, that stretch of land there. I live on Arlington Place. Yeah, our backyard is behind three yards on Hawthorne. So if it, if it were to, you know, the parking lot butt up to those houses, to their backyards. And my kids do run around that street and play, and they have friends across the street, and that is a community. That is not just a 27 thoroughfare. We have a walkable community. Well, I will leave it to the Planning Commission to give direction as to whether or not we want to scrap this district, if we want to make, um, you know. You know, I think since we don't have a full forum, I think it's obviously something that we were going to come back and revisit. And I think it's something that, you know, you've all, all expressed your concerns. And I think we can certainly, you know, convey that to the rest of the Planning Commission and ultimately make a decision. You know, those decisions aren't made tonight. Decisions aren't going to be made in July or August. You know, there is a lot of work to be done here before those decisions are made. So you've all expressed your concerns, and obviously I think we'll bring it back to the full board when we have a full board and and ultimately make a decision on it. You know, I, I think that's that's the best we can do at this point. We, we've heard your concerns. We see them. We feel them. You know, unfortunately, we do need to move on to the next topic. But that being said, um, you know, we want to give them value and ultimately, you know, let the Planning Commission decide on those, um, which they weren't going to be deciding on any of this till very late in the year. Yeah, but that's, that's why we're here, though. You want our input, right? And that's, that's what, what yeah, we've right. got it. We appreciate it. Absolutely. That's yeah. why we invited you. That's why I call you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's why I called you. I want to know what's going on. I'm saying that open, and I appreciate that. But a lot less time was spent on this than was spent on that. And I think that the residents deserve every bit as much listening to as research was done to develop this. And I'm not a spokesman for any person, and I'm not a spokesperson for any of the group, but exceptions can be made, exceptions can be made. Once that door is open, that this is now zone this, Katie Barton door. Because the right person can ask the right person the right question, and the exception is made. And what in the vision tonight doesn't exist, they can be raised the ground on. The zoning change is where the door gets open. Once again, I think our planning commission has spelled what you, what you, you, you expressed. And honestly, I think once again, we, we need to move on to the next topic. But we have heard you. And I think the uh, planning commission will certainly will express those concerns to the planning commission and ultimately make these decisions. Can I ask one question not on this one, but the one right before this one? The one that's between, it's really the next street, Hawthorne to Hollywood. Tell me one more time what's happening to that. So where the orange starts, I believe. Yeah, that's the mixed-use district that we were talking about initially. 
So you're saying that all of those properties that are right there on Hawthorne, again, that back up to all of those properties. Well, for the down in your arrow. Um, right there. So all the stuff that's from there to, to Hollywood, you're saying that that you're, because I thought I heard you say before that they were going to all say what they are, but now I hear you saying maybe that they're going to be multi use today. Right now there are some. Well, not all of them are commercial. Some of them are R1C. No, they're all either multifamily or commercial. Right. Well, when did no, they're not? And the reason I know is because, well, no, hold on a second, hold on a second. I'm, I'm just saying, because when we did the, when we did the, um, you know, the storage facility, they were going to do a text amendment. That was a zone change. That was a zone change. So it, it was, was still R1C, though. Uh, yes, those two houses okay. that are before, yeah, those, the, are those are residential. Right, there are three. Yes, there is. That's Which is multifamily. No, no they, were, they were single unless somebody changed them without anybody this knowing is the, about This it. is the 2013, I, I don't want to, I'm not trying to okay. argue. This, this is the 2013 zoning map for the city. So they were Thomas. residential, but they were residential multifamily. Right. Well, right. They just can't allow, they so can't allow storage. So residential multifamily means R3? Mm -hmm. So there's residential yeah. one, R1 is single family, R2 and 3 right and 5 are multifamily. Again, they're proposing design standards, but they'll be less stringent than the ones along US 27. Um, with the exception of the corridor of Highland and Grand, there are specific design standards to address that corner. And then we will be incentivizing gathering spaces. The community plan talks about having Thank gathering spaces yeah. within our commercial districts. And so we will be incentivizing that in the same way, exempting 5,000 square feet of parking if they provide doing gathering spaces. And so when we were here back um, in the fall for the room, we were talking about what should the size of those gathering spaces be. And the Planning Commission suggested that maybe we actually give a range of the types of gathering spaces that are proposed. So what you will see is that for the smaller gathering spaces like a plaza or a square, you, if you um, will forgive 2,500 square feet of parking if you provide those. 
or if you provide something as large as a quarter of an acre or more, then you would first get 5,000 square feet of parking. And then the definitions for what's a plaza and a square are all in the draft. So that was in response to your request that we provide um, something besides larger gathering spaces in this district. Any concerns about that? Did I, was I responsive in terms of your desire to have a range of gathering spaces? Yes, yes. All right, so do we have any questions from the audience about the neighborhood commercial office district? Is there a way that we can get anything written on that as opposed to just looking online? Um, I mean, it's all on the website, right? Mm -hmm. It's all there. I, I said, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. I, I, I guess maybe I just find it hard when you're directed to, and I don't know about this particular document, a 250 page, um, 257 page document that on page 180 it says refer to the key, which happens to me, you're not sure where by the time you find it, you have to look back. I just find that difficult. I mean, all these, all this is on, uh, if you go under news on the main page, go under news, there, there's several tabs. Go under news and go under, the first tab is zoning code update. These individual presentations are there. And they're relatively small in size. They're 40 pages, 50 pages in that range um, that have all this content that we've talked about up to this point with the, the, as far as the update. I was just asking if there's a way to get a hard copy. Yeah, I do have a question. So it, until this point, you were showing, the other, you were showing these, um, the different businesses that are there right now with 50, you know, 50 feet front yards, six front, not front yards, but setbacks. Is what you're proposing, number three, to bring all of them all the way up to the pike? Is that what you're thinking? So again, this is not along the pike. It's for Fort Thomas Plaza, Highland and Grand. And no, the only thing the picture on the bottom shows is all of those nice large open windows. I see, thank you. And then the picture at the top, um, Jerry had said, you know, what, is it, what happens if you have a minimum height and they don't want to build a two-story building? What does that look like? That was the question he had asked at some point, and I don't remember when. Um, and so that picture on the top was to, to show what happens if you don't have a usable second floor, but you do still have some height. All right, so now we're going to move on to the uh, riveting discussion of administrative <laughs> procedures. <laughs> um, and so again, what we will try to do is, y'all, these are short administrative chapters, and I'll stop after every couple and say, does anybody have any questions? But again, this is actually even more boring than what we were already talking about. Um, so the Article 1 for this, which is our main topic of discussion tonight, does include the general provisions and the administration. You will notice that um, section 1.1 is the definitions. It's really too early in order to draft those because there's so much still being uh, done with the code that it's really not worth the effort to draft the definitions. But everything else is in your packet and hopefully online. Um, really much of the existing administrative provisions that are currently in your zoning ordinance will be remaining. In many cases, we've just lifted them up and put them here. You will notice in the draft that any changes are either underlined and bolded if they're being added, or they're struck out if they're being um, changed. So in terms of section 1.2, this is the establishment of districts. Um, it's broken up into all the types of districts that you have. The top portion are the conventional districts that we've been talking about for the last two months. Um, and then the bottom portion is the form-based districts, and that will be the, the meat of the conversation in July. So all this section really does is just establish those districts. Section 1.3 is the powers and duties section. Um, and it lays out the powers and duties and responsibilities of the zoning administrator, the city engineer, the planning commission, the tree commission, the design review board, and the board of adjustment. Um, and really these are all the individuals and the boards and commissions and the city council, or the board of council, yes, um, that really do have some administration responsibilities for so all of those are in um, draft. What you will notice, for example, is like there was really no powers and duties really built and laid out in the existing ordinance for the zoning administrator for the city engineer. And so all of those have been placed in this chapter. In terms 
also the development review process is essentially what we have today. It will generally move through in three stages. Um, what we did call out specifically for was a pre-application meeting, which is not uh, currently in your ordinance. As it's currently drafted, that pre-application can be with staff or the planning commission, um, depending upon what the circumstances are. Then we've got stage one review, so let's take a step back. Stage one is more preliminary. Those currently all come to the planning commission and that will stay the same under this draft. But prior to coming here, they go to the design review board and to the tree commission. The tree commission was founded after this ordinance and so it's just sort of snut in. And so we are actually making it more official in this document. Then the stage one documents would come to this planning commission for approval. And then if it's a more complicated plan, it would then go to a stage two review, which would be conducted by the zoning administrator. Um, Kevin has let me know that in many cases, you just really get applications that come at that stage two level and end up in front of the planning commission. And so I've codified that a little bit more in this draft. I have removed from this draft the submittal requirements for you know, a stage one and a stage two. And that's really because requiring, you know, saying things like your plan has to be 24 by 36 and include these things and a north arrow and all of that. And over time, what we learned is that it really shouldn't be a zoning amendment because you change what is necessary to be submitted with an application. That should just be on the front of the application itself. And so I have pulled those out of the code. And then we've also included within that chapter criteria for the review of the stage one and stage two plans. So right now, while the planning commission or the zoning administrator reviews these plans, there's really no standards or criteria for them to review by. So I've included those as well. So I'm going to stop right here and say any questions about districts established, um, site plan review, or the powers of duties. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So you got this review by the tree commission. So is this like a conservation group that tells you you need so much green space and so much trees before you know, to keep with the upkeep of what Fort Thomas looks like instead of being able to put down a whole solid building? Is that what that's about? So the tree. No, I was just going to say we have certain landscape requirements. There's certain extent of if any tree, a certain amount of tree is taken down, it has very specific regulations as far as size of trees, number of trees. That that has to be um, a, a survey given, essentially, and tell us what you did. And there has to be a compensation for those types of trees in some other manner. So uh, they they have to present that plan. The tree commission evaluates that and makes sure that they. Meet the regulations that we have in place. Okay, so that's not in place now. There, there, no, that currently is in place. It's just in different places. So oh, okay. She's, it, it's in ordinance form versus in the this zoning ordinance because the tree commission was established after our zoning ordinance. The the main document was was uh, was adopted. So we're trying to put a lot of stuff and meet back into the zoning ordinance this way instead of it being just in a separate document. And the tree commission is an active commission in town. I mean, they meet monthly. and then it's presented to the planning commission after those other reviews and recommendations have been presented. I just have a question. Yes, so I said, going back to the question of why we're even here at all, um, instead of doing zoning changes, form-based zoning changes, we know last month, I think, the, a few of us were here were a bit concerned, like, you know, asking these guys, do you want two windows, four windows, is that door, that kind of door? Would it be uh, an idea to have a design guide, not putting it to zoning but to have a process like this, have a design guide that people in Fort Thomas will come together and agree on, that could, could be changed, it could be changed if it needed to be. We will probably have to modify that document. We have a design, set of design guidelines for our central business districts now. Um, that's what we've talked about earlier, how the design review board will have expanding their purview over the commercial districts. We will likely have to revise that document as well. Um, but there is a separate document on our website that has the design guidelines for these two districts. Now, that's going to be another discussion is how, how those, that, that document might change because we are expanding our program. So what we're talking about here, though, is putting this in 
reform base, we're talking about changing the law, right, changing ordinances, rather than just going, not just, but another idea, keeping things the way they are, and maybe tweaking setbacks, tweaking, you know, just so we don't get another thing we got on Fort Thomas Avenue right now. But going through a process like this, where they would come before a design review board, there would be guidelines that wouldn't have the force of law. That's so the design like guidelines, uh, and currently as they are, are ultimately recommendations to the design review board. The design review board doesn't have the same powers as um, the planning commission or council. They're, it's kind of a, a working relationship. They try to try to get there. So what some of these regulations are doing is putting those things in concrete and in stone to require people to do them um, more more solidly. Um, some of the design review is, is, is um, it, it's, it's not the case right now. So I think by putting these in the ordinance, it creates standards that they have to abide by, period. The other regulations uh, aren't as concrete. So I guess what I'm saying is, that, but if we put them into law, now we have eight guys, there's not a woman on the commission, uh, no designers at all, um, who are going to be making these decisions about what Fort Thomas is going to look like, they carry the force of law. So versus what we have right now, that people could, that you could make a design guide that could be tweaked or changed or maybe put together by some people who have that kind of expertise. Well, I think the Design Review Board will be reviewing all these. You know, there, there are certain criteria that need to be met, but the Design Review Board is going to be looking at these as well. And certainly, um, you know, those things can be tweaked. I think. The, the, the language itself is bare minimum. I mean, these are extensive standards. They're bare minimum standards that we want to see is, is, is the guts. And the Design Review Board can, you know, tweak, tweak other things that are, you know, beyond that. And Kevin, the Design Review Board is made up of, there are uh, ladies on there and there are uh, designers. designers. Yeah. Yeah, those are our landscape, uh, like all levels of designers, and, and they'll have purview over any of these projects. But like last month it was like with a garage where you have two windows or no windows or this kind of door or this kind of hinge. I think we talked about hinges last month. That, isn't that something more appropriate for a, a design guide rather than to put that into the force of law? So that's a policy choice. I mean, it really is. And who and makes so that policy choice? Would that be city council that will make that policy choice? So this board recommends, mm -hmm. and it came from a discussion that we had back during the phase one, that many, many community members are uncomfortable with some of the garages that face the street, and how could, what standards could be placed within the code that would help mitigate some of the discomfort that Kevin and the Planning Commission has heard. And so they are, you know, so A, it was a policy choice to even start thinking about the design of those. And again, it's only for garages that front the street on lots that are a certain width. But you know, as we're talking about all of this stuff, it is a policy choice that could be changed if you feel like, if this board and the council feels like that's a step too far to be regulating what the look of someone's garage is, then we certainly we can pull that out. But that came from a discussion um, with this planning commission and some of the community members that were here that these very large garages where all you really see from the street is the garage and maybe the front door um, was no longer appropriate or is not appropriate for Fort Thomas's character. It could be then come up with something that would prohibit or eliminate or reduce the um, ugliness, for lack of a better word. Um, yeah, I should have said something better. Um, reduce the monotony of these very large garages. So that's where that came from. But in terms of you know, the, the commercial and the office districts, again, that will go to the design review board prior to coming here. And as the city attorney said, they, they really do have designers, architects, landscape architects on that board. And the standards that are in well, the commercial districts are not nearly as specific as what we were talking about for those garages. They're things like, it has to face the street. And you would think, that that is uh, something that would be automatic. But if you don't say things like that, people will then orient their building so that people are then 
entering from the back parking lot or from the side parking lot, and therefore you have a blank face facing your street, and is that really what you want for the character of your commercial districts? It says like you have to have windows on the front of your building. Again, these are very bare minimum types of standards that are put in the code just simply to give guidance, but can be, you know, by design review board, as I said, can waive them, give modifications depending upon individual circumstances. Because again, the community is largely built out. Yes, ma'am. Is the board of council the same as city council? Yes, ma'am, it is. Um, so the, the current ordinance calls it the board of council instead of the city council. And I don't know why. Um, I actually asked Kevin if he said he didn't know. Um, it's a game of so <laughs> Some technicality. Yeah. Oh, I guess, yeah. <laughs> so, so we kept it. Why they call it that, I don't know. I have a question for yes, you. Sir. Uh, section 1-3 here, uh, the, uh, uh, what is it for, powers and duties? Yes, sir. Is that, what powers uh, do the planning zoning, what will change with it? Will, will this allow them to have more authority over change uh, than it did previously, or is it staying the same? It's pretty much staying the same. Right. We were, our, our marching orders coming into this, were to keep as much of the administrative procedures as possible because they were working well. Cool. We don't always get that direction, to be honest with you. Well, I can imagine everybody likes that a little bit power of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, section 1.5 is zoning permits and certificate of zoning compliance. Uh, currently, you have a zoning permit, and that is issued before construction commences, but after the development plan has been um, approved whether it's been approved by Kevin or whether it's been approved by the Planning Commission. What is new is the Certificate of Zoning Compliance, and it will be issued by the Zoning Administrator when the project is constructed, and the, that, that certificate will certify that the project was constructed in compliance with the Zoning Ordinance and with all approvals. And so that is new. In terms of Section 1.6, this is the Conditional Use Permit. Um, it is heard by the Board of Adjustment, which is yet a different board than what we've been talking about. Um, and this is the board that hears, um, and we'll talk about this in more in a minute, variances and appeals. But it's heard by the Board of Adjustment, and that is required by the Kentucky Revised Code. And this chapter just simply keeps in place your existing process. All the procedures will stay the same. And then keep in mind that conditional use is a use that's permitted in the district only if the conditional use is approved by the Board of Adjustment. So it is a much more rigorous review than um, to that you see in those use charts that set P. Section 1.7 is the Appeals and Variances section. Um, right now, your code does not clearly delineate between the appeal from administrative decisions and variances. So we are very clearly delineating what those two things are and what the processes are for them both of which are heard by the Board of Adjustment, and the existing process for variances is retained. So let's just sort of step back for a minute and what is an appeal from an administrative decision. So what that would be, for example, is if someone is proposing a new use in the district. And they say, well, you know, Kevin, you should really allow, me, allow that because it's basically the same thing as a drugstore. And Kevin says, you know what, I don't think it is. So they can appeal Kevin's decision, the zoning administrator's decision, to the Board of Adjustment. So that's what an appeal and administrative decision is. And then a variance is if someone has that, you know, they want a front setback of 25 feet, but the district is 30 feet, that's the requirement, they can go to the Board of Adjustment and request a variance. Section 1.8 um, are the zoning amendments. This section covers both the amendments to text and to map as well as the process. The process for both of those is that it's heard by this commission and then goes to the city council or the board of council for the final determination. So before we move on uh, to nonconformity, are there any questions about appeals, appearances, amendments, any of those kinds of things? Zoning map amendments, is that covered in the amendment section or is that totally Yes, different? yeah, it's covered in the, um, in the amendment section as well. And has anything changed along those lines? No. In general, if you want to change a zone, you have to prove a number of things that it was 
not appropriate blue zone to begin with, the nature of the dark character of the neighborhood has changed, or you know, the, the community has changed to where that, that zoning uh, is no longer appropriate. That's all those things are still in there. Yes, it's all still here. And if you will look at that, the draft, virtually every bit of it is working more for your current code. The only thing I changed was simply the change code section numbers of that. And where is that? Because I didn't see that. It's uh, section 1.8. Oh, seven. Sorry. Yeah, 1.807, sorry. 